Hello everyone and welcome back to my Mars colonization series in Kerbal Space Program 1.6.1. In this video we are continuing with the construction of Mars Transfer Vehicle 2 and as such I'm going to do it as post commentary and uh, we are going to expedite this as much as possible since you've already seen the construction of this kind of vehicle in the earlier episodes. Though admittedly there were some problems with the way I did it in the earlier episodes that we're fixing along the way this time. So, uh, for instance, we are going to make sure we have hydrazine for the EVAs and the Quest Air Lock and all that business. And we have made sure that we don't have to explode parts. Actually, uh, by the end of this episode, there will be one part that I'll want a Kerbal to get rid of, but uh, that's later in the episode. So for the first thing, we need to send up two more solar trusses. We've already put one on to the Mars transfer vehicle, and this is the other two. As we see the first stage run out, second stage ignition, and of course all of the launches now will be with KOS, uh, since I know the margins from my own control of the flights in the earlier episodes. We've got fairing separation in a thousand meters, and there we go. So there are our trusses. Uh, placed on that bicoupler along with little decouplers to make sure they don't get stuck to the stage or anything and uh, Yeah, everything is going well here We of course need a certain amount of margin so that the stage can help with the rendezvous And then the tug will come out and grab them one at a time uh, the stage Delta V down there isn't reading properly because of the way the, the um, trusses are placed on that bicoupler so uh, here we are in orbit with a pretty good relative inclination and rendezvous should be a breeze. So aside from this whole business, I do want to develop a Hydrolox rocket of some kind and that will occur in the rocket science series, which I haven't done any videos in for a while, but that's where I do all the detailed math for designing stuff and where I design the Sagita rocket and all sorts of other stuff like the lander stage. So here comes the tug to grab our trusses. Note that the tug has plenty of delta V on its own, but once it has some sort of payload that dramatically goes down, that'll be important later in the video. So here we go, very careful docking between the propellant only docking ports, also designed in the rocket science series. The only rough thing about the propellant only docking ports is that they're so thin that it's tough sometimes to right click on them properly to get the right one. Uh, that's one minor downside, I suppose, but uh, otherwise very useful. Uh, same mass roughly as the stockish propellant only docking ports that are modified by realism overhaul. Anyway, so here we're lining up, making sure that the roll is right so that uh, people don't have a cow <laughs> and uh, which is one thing that the propellant only docking boards that I designed are good at. They're not circular, so there's really a very clear indication of how they're supposed to fit together. And we continue. So we'll grab the second truss. So overall, our solar power is going to be the same. That's what we're looking at. We're looking at about 480 kilowatts in total possible at Earth, and then diminishing down once we get to Mars. Um, and so, again, at Mars, we won't be capable of full throttle on the ion engines. It'll be about 60% on the ion engines. However, I have modified the ion engines so that they have double their thrust. So instead of having 54 newtons each, they'll have 108 newtons each. And they still weigh 2.27 uh, tons. They're meant to be 10 of the X3 ion thrusters, which currently exist. In exchange for having the higher thrust, I've diminished the ISP to 2,800 instead of 3,280. So that's the hit we're going to take. And otherwise, I plan to pack the same amount of uh, xenon gas, but more methane and oxygen, since we definitely seem to need more of that. We'll see how that works out for us. Um, I plan to build a second ship, uh, and that will be one without HAB but just supplies. So we'll send that along with uh, this ship and hopefully that can support our crew. Of course, they won't be able to rendezvous along the way to Mars, 
they'll have to wait until they get to Mars to rendezvous if it becomes necessary for the crew to access those supplies. So that's the downside. No avoiding that though. I mean, I guess I have seen people try and have KOS control two different ships simultaneously as long as they're in render range. I've even done that myself with the Falcon Heavy Boosters. And maybe we could get them to do the burns simultaneously like that if we get them exactly right. Uh, but I suspect that that's probably very difficult and not worthwhile. Sending an actual armada to Mars would be a whole lot easier in real life than in the game because of the game's render limits and basically our ability to control one vessel at a time. Still not impossible. Definitely not impossible. So what we have here is one of the methane oxygen tanks. On the previous Mars transfer vehicle we only had one of these and this time we'll have two. So this is the first one and it'll be placed ahead of the two xenon gas tanks. It's not currently full and neither was the one that we sent with the Mars transfer vehicle. It's used to store all the fuel from the tugs as well so because it's got the MLI layers, the insulation so that the fuel and oxidizer do not boil off. So here we go making correction burns and rendezvousing with the Mars Transit Vehicle 2. Still just called MTV2. I haven't decided on a name yet, but I really need to. And now we need to get the tug out, and that will grab the tank. And it's a pretty hefty load for the tug. The tug is, well, at least it is one of the big tugs. We aren't, we aren't using the little tugs I originally introduced at the beginning of the series. We've just gone with the bigger model. The smaller model has a 1.875 meter diameter and the bigger model of the tug has a 2.5 meter diameter basically. But that's the sphere diameter on those tanks. And the 2.5 meter one can take a 5 meter payload on its center line. So that's basically the difference. Also of course the bigger one has more fuel. So here we go. And again, this uh, fuel module is basically a duplicate of the upper stage of the Sagita rocket and uh, somewhat modified. Now the part that I need to get rid of, you might see that there's a propellant only docking port clipping into the RCS port at the top on one of the sides. I didn't realize that I hadn't placed the propellant only docking ports in symmetry and placed them individually instead. So when I removed one, I thought I had removed the other one, but I didn't. And so it's clipping into one of the RCS ports I placed on that instead. Since uh, we're going to have another methane oxygen tank that will have the docking ports anyway, so I didn't need a duplicate of that, I decided more RCS ports were probably a better idea, since the darn thing has a lot of trouble turning, to be frank. Any RCS ports that we can add that probably would uh, benefit it. The RCS ports, though, are not very powerful. These are 100 Newton RCS ports. They're not meant to be powerful, they're meant to be sparing, especially when we get down to using smart ASS and everything. So there's a xenon tank, and uh, that's the one that's carrying the hydrazine for the uh, EVAs, because with Kerbalism we need hydrazine for the EVAs. For some reason, I, I guess I didn't have the Sagita heavies configured properly in the VAB because the launch script knows that needs to it is an action group to extend the nozzle and everything. But that wasn't set up right. But anyway, I fixed it. We continued with the rendezvous. And approaching MTV2. Once again, we're getting a lot of work out of this tug today. It's the same tug each time. It's the one with the propellant only docking port on the center line. And it just barely fits this tank. So good times. And we have been deorbiting the Sagita upper stages instead of leaving them in orbit. Trying to be good citizens in that respect. So there we go. And now bringing in this 40 ton tank into the Mars transfer vehicle. Once again, back with the Xenon. That's a nice view. 
lots of nice views in this episode. Most of the docking is occurring during daylight as opposed to nighttime, thankfully. And things are coming together nicely. So, just waiting for contact. There we go. And for this episode, I'll just wrap it up with another one of the Xenon tanks. So that's this launch on a Sajita Heavy. Rocking that structure that I made for it. Now, this Xenon tank does not have the Hydrazine. Instead, it's got a reaction wheel. Um, it's one of the larger reaction wheels, as modified by a realism overhaul, so it only provides one torque. I don't know what the units are, but it's one torque. Uh, currently, the MTB2 only has a reaction wheel in the control module at the very front, and that has 0.5 torque. Uh, so, anyway, so this one will basically yield triple the torque from the reaction wheels for it, but still, it's not going to turn very fast with just the reaction wheels. But maybe, you know, in the long run it'll help. It's better than carrying more hydrazine anyway. Alright, so the upper stage. A little pause there. Still need to manually bring out the nozzle there. There we go. You'll notice I also slapped little uh, KW rocketry batteries on my Sajita upper stages since these uh, Xenon tanks don't have any battery of their own, nor any solar panels. And batteries are cheaper than solar panels. There's the reaction wheel. Just the stock model, very typical. Now, one downside was that I ended up with a bad relative inclination there, because I mistimed our launch, and that didn't leave me with a whole lot of Delta V for rendezvous. As a result, I had to use the tug here, to uh, go out quite a distance, uh, more than 30 kilometers, to grab the Xenon tank. Now once again, while the tug on its own has plenty of Delta V, once it grabs onto the Xenon tank it doesn't, so this rendezvous will have to be done carefully. I think the tug plus the Xenon tank has about 500 meters per second, so we want to make sure to do the, all the burns carefully so that we don't waste fuel. After all, that just means we have to lug it up here again, at least for now. I mean, I suppose we could set up drilling operations on the moon, but I don't think that's particularly efficient with the methane and oxygen, and probably not legit with the methane and oxygen anyway. Oxygen, fine. Methane, not so much. The moon's not supposed to have carbon like that. I did manage to keep a little bit of delta V in this stage so that it could deorbit itself, which I did here. The tug is just flipping around with that heavy xenon tank right now. And there we go. Over Southeast Asia it looks like. But probably it'll dunk itself into the Pacific. As it should. And so now the tug brings it towards the Mars transfer vehicle. And you can see the Delta V reading there. And we line up. So this has been a very short episode compared to my normal Mars colonization series episodes. But that's because I'm just trying to get through this. Obviously, this stuff took a lot longer than what's being depicted here. I mean, many, many hours of launching and docking and all that business. Now, this is particularly quick in realism overhaul. So I hope you appreciate that. And we'll try and get to more innovative things in another episode. Probably the next episode will still be more construction of this. And for some reason I had trouble docking this uh, Xenon tank. That's basically when I decided that I probably had to quit for the day. Um, again, I did this all in one sitting and by this point I was a little tired, I'm sure. So trying to line up there. While Smart ASS can wiggle sometimes, I'm at least thankful for its help holding that roll. So that we got that down, I didn't have to worry about that manually. Okay, get on with it. Alright, there we go. So, uh, yep, more than 200 tons in orbit around the Earth right now. And we still need to do the propulsion unit, which includes the other methane tank. And then Quest Air Lock and uh, Food, Water, and Oxygen. And more or less then we'll be set. Uh, we could add a lander or something like that. You can see I'm checking the torque on the reaction wheels here. And basically we're talking about it turning about 0.1 degrees every second or something like that. So just on the reaction wheels, it's not very quick at turning. But anyway, with this constructed as it is right now, 
I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.